And good morning, church. Whoa, that's a hearty good morning. That's a good way to get it started. I appreciate that. And uh, so grateful to see each and every one of you here today. And those of you that are visiting, we are thrilled you could be here with us uh, this morning. And those of you that are online, uh, it looks like we have some new people that might be joining us online today. And that's thrilling. We're glad you could be here with us as well. Hope you have your Bibles uh, beside you on your app or whatever way that you utilize the Bible. And uh, we're going to be going through several scriptures today as we talk about the idea of modeling Christianity uh, for as we disciple people very deliberately. I'll tell you a couple of other things that are going on. It's pretty exciting. Uh, we do have a congregational meeting today and we'll go into more detail then. But, you know, in relating to uh, evangelism and some of the things that are happening in our congregation with evangelism. And I know we've just spent 10 weeks uh, plus talking about it, but here's some projects that we have coming up that I think maybe you'd want to know just a little bit about. We'll give more details in the congregational meeting, but one of the things we're doing in conjunction with Rodney and the visitation group is if people have been visiting uh, multiple times and they're showing a real interest in our congregation and in becoming a Christian, we have Bibles uh, that are being uh, prepared for them and they'll be given to them. But what's really neat in terms of evangelism is there'll be an insert, a fold out that we've been working on with me and Steve Daup and Rodney uh, to help them understand how to use the Bible in order to become a Christian. That sets a tone for who we are and what we stand for and what we believe and how we want people to come to know Jesus. And they are able to do that through understanding God's word. So we'll be generous in that way. A second thing we're looking at is, you know, in terms of how to get content to study the Bible. It's one of the most common questions that we are asked. And there's several different uh, ways that you can approach that, several different tools, but very little in the digital world. And so we're looking at ways that we can uh, reach out and answer the question of how do I carry something with me on my phone or my iPad so that I can have a Bible study material on hand 24-7. That's pretty exciting. We're also looking at ways in November that we can have uh, a training session for our people to answer a lot of questions and get your experience um, in evangelism and ways that we can strengthen ourselves and, and utilize new tools and, like I said, your own wisdom and experience in doing that. That'll be coming up in November. And then we're also looking at ways that we can utilize the internet and digital media videos, short form and long form, to help spread the gospel. These are projects for 2022 and 2023. We're pretty excited about that. I'll go into more details later, but I share that with you now so that you can see things are underway. People are being very, very busy, and it's exciting stuff that's unfolding. I respect all the people that are um, participating in these and are helping contribute to them. It's a lot of experience. It's a lot of love for the Lord that makes all the difference in the world. So I know these are going to turn out fantastic, and I hope you'll be a part of them as well. I'm not going to use that and springboard into the idea of modeling Christianity. As we said the last two weeks, we don't want the people, the new converts, or even experienced Christians to learn how to be a follower of Jesus by accident. Almost like they have to kind of figure out on their own. If we want people to become very, very strong Christians, those of us that have more experience need to take the time to help develop and help show them not just to be Christians, but to be amazing Christians, excellent Christians. At the very least, we would expect someone to come to church on a regular basis, at the very least, because you're worshiping your God and you need to have a heart for your God, but that's the very least. At the very least, we would hope someone would come and serve in some capacity at the congregation. But that's the very, very least. At some level, we would hope someone would come in and say, listen, show me how. Show me how that I can participate and be a part of this congregation and, and maybe go out and do a little bit of mission work as well. Very least. A lot of that focuses only on Sunday or Wednesday. But seven days a week, how do we, on a practical day-to-day -day basis, become better, stronger Christians? How do we show other people and instruct the brethren and in how to develop as a Christian? We've got to model that behavior, which means we have to be reflective on ourselves and are we living up to that behavior? And what standard do we live at? And how do we teach that to other people without being arrogant and prideful because those things have no place in Christianity? So we have to have a biblical definition. And that's where we're going to start today. There's three things we want to cover today overall. And if you're taking notes, these are the broad points that we're going to go through today. Uh, first of all, we're going to look at Bible knowledge. 
If you're going to understand what it means to be a Christian, you have to begin in God's Word. The world is going to define Christianity in whatever way it seems to flow. And those definitions from a worldly perspective, they shift all the time. Not interested in those things. I need to know what God says a Christian is. You have to have a biblical foundation first. So we're going to go to the Bible and look at how the Bible describes Christians. That's very, very important. Second of all, we need Bible examples. I love what Rodney said in the, during the Lord's Supper. There's so many of our fellow Christians that we can look at and they can show us some things, but we've got to start with the Bible examples first. Jesus, initially. But what about places where people are being very successful, God approved, in the way that they are serving him throughout the Bible? The greater list we can have of those people, the more information we have to draw on. This is how God wants to see this done. And that puts us on a trajectory to draw closer to him, to better fulfill righteousness and holiness and faithfulness in him. Thirdly, what about modern Christian examples? Modern Christian examples. We'll see how that played out in the Bible, but also today. Can you think about, in fact, right now, can you think about people that you love dearly, or maybe people that you know from afar even, so it's direct or indirect, that have been amazing examples of Christianity? And you've seen something in them that's helped you develop as well. That's where we're going in this. And those people will be defined by how the Bible defines Christianity, and they'll follow examples as we see those examples in the Bible. But that's what led them to be the Christians they are today. And probably somebody helped them learn to be a disciple. That's what we're going to look at. Let's go back to our scripture reading. And if you've got that on hand, so 1 Timothy chapter 4, uh, verses 6 through 11, we'll look at a couple verses here. But we're going to begin with that Bible knowledge. What does a faithful Christian look like? Not physical appearance, but inwardly, through their actions, through their thoughts, and, and how that manifests. What does that look like? Well, in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6, we get this idea of the modeling coming forth because Paul is telling Timothy to instruct the brethren. Instruct the brethren. This is fellow Christians that he's putting his focus on. And he tells them this, that they're going to be, he's a good minister because he's nourished in the words of faith, and the good doctrine which he has carefully followed. It's all based in the word, the modeling that he's doing and the teaching he's given to the brethren. So he's developing disciples. And then he's got this qualifier to tell the reason behind what they're doing here. Paul's given to him. He says, to this end, we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God. God is always a part of the process here in the modeling, and he's always a a presence in our lives today as Christians, and so we have to build confidence in God's willingness and desire to help us as we move along. These things command and teach. And so in Timothy, it's real interesting because we have an example of a lineage of modeling that's unfolding here, from Jesus to Paul to Timothy and then to the brethren. And we benefit because throughout that history, the 2,000 years of history of Christianity, each generation has been responsible for building up disciples onto the next so that eventually it gets to us. And we have to be mindful of what generation we will be preparing for next. Do we give them the benefit of all those generations of wisdom and knowledge of experience, or do we just allow them to haphazardly feel for their ways? One is clearly more wise than the other. I love with Jesus and Paul. Paul gives this great quote in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 1. Imitate me, just as I also imitate Christ. Immediately in our heads, we think about the relationship between Jesus and Paul. We know he's an apostle, but it was sort of in an atypical way, wasn't it? He didn't run around with the 12 initially, but Jesus still cared for him immensely. Even as he was on that road to Damascus, Jesus appeared to him and said, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And he was giving him that question so that Paul could reflect then Saul as he's going in. And it was just days away from him being, becoming a Christian, being baptized, having his sins washed away and becoming a Christian. Jesus spoke to him and he appeared to him in that blinding light. Jesus would also appear to Ananias, who was to receive him. And Ananias was, of course, very hesitant. This is Paul. Don't you know what he's doing, Jesus? And Jesus says, yeah, I have a plan for him. He tells Ananias that who Paul is going to go out and share the gospel with, this is Jesus' plan. It's deliberate. It's very deliberate what he's wanting Paul to do. 
Paul becomes a Christian, which is amazing. People struggle with it, so Barnabas comes in and reinforces him. It's amazing. And he goes out and he starts teaching in Antioch, and he goes on these missionary journeys. And during that time where he's doing all the things that Jesus wants him to do, Jesus still appears to him. Right? Less, less known things that we talk about. Usually in the conversion we get that appearance of Jesus. But in Acts chapter 18, Jesus appears to him uh, in verses 9 and 10, and he gives him this, this opening phrase, which I love in dis- uh, turning someone into a, a, an amazing disciple. He says, do not be afraid. There's some hard things that Paul was going to have to do, and Jesus is there with him, comforting him and saying, do not be afraid. In fact, in Acts chapter 23, verse 11, he gives him a, another encouraging statement when he says, be of good cheer. Can you imagine? You are going about the works of Jesus. You are working hard, and there's a lot of pushback. There's a lot of things that are working for you and against you. And Jesus is there with you, and he says, be of good cheer. You're doing amazing. You are doing the things I want you to do. What an incredible instructor. We would expect no less from the master teacher, Jesus. But he's encouraging him, pushing him along. And this is a brother with a lot of experience who's going through some heavy things, but Jesus is there for him. And Paul says, imitate me just as I imitate Christ. There's a lineage of teaching that's going on there. And then it extends from Paul to Timothy. Of course, you know, Paul found Timothy in Acts chapter 16 and he brought him along. And what an incredible opportunity this was for Timothy. Now he had been instructed by his mother and grandmother So he had some teaching and training there, which was to be appreciated for sure. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, Paul takes note of that. But to be able to go with Paul and Silas and Luke through Acts chapter 16, to go to the church of Philippi and see that established, see the enthusiasm they had to go down to the river and to to preach and teach and to convert people, see the opposition that uh, the pagans would have to Christianity and to still pierce right through it, to stand your ground for the gospel. What an amazing, amazing moment and example of Christianity modeled that Timothy had. He grew to the point that Paul was giving him great charge over things, installing elderships to, to, to bring him materials and such. But in 1 Timothy chapter 4, we see this modeling going on in which he tells him to instruct the brethren. Yeah, you've been taught, Timothy, but you've got to carry that on as well. Instruct the brethren. And these things command and teach. Take responsibility for the Christians around you. That's what's being modeled. From Jesus to Paul, to Timothy, to the brethren, to us. What an amazing responsibility. But he narrows down what it means to be a Christian. Not just to participate in that modeling, but what does it mean to actually be a Christian? What does it look like to be a Christian? He gives them a broad definition of it here in 1 Timothy 4.12. A lot of times we hear that one because it's an encouragement to just the young people. But it's not just the young people. Look what he says. Let no one despise your youth. Fantastic. Be an example to the believers, to the other Christians, no matter their age. In word, in conduct, in love, in faith, in spirit, and in purity. Be an example in all those things. And those are things we would normally say, well, yeah, those look like Christian things. But if we spend time developing that, we may go, well, what exactly does that mean? Great question. Paul's also going to give us some other details of what that looks like in these other passages. Take, for example, 2 Timothy 2, verses 19 through 26. Turn over there with me, if you will. You might already be there, or you're pretty close to it regardless. Here's some things that we note about a Christian. Now, that's someone who has heard the gospel and they certainly believe it and they trust it and they're willing to obey. They're going to submit themselves to Jesus. They're going to commit to a life of Christianity. These are people who would have repented and given up a sinful life. They would have repented from the thinking of the world and turned to the mindset of God. These are people that would confess that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. These are people that would be baptized, that is to be immersed uh, so that their sins would be washed away. And these are people that would you know, decide to live a faithful life. But here's some more details that go into it. And I love this about 2 Timothy 2, uh, 1 Peter, and Romans chapter 12. We won't have time to get through all of these, but I want you to get just a feeling of what he's going into. Write these down and look at these for yourself. They're a great place to reflect. Am I participating in the fullness of Christianity? 
And how can I use these to show someone else what a Christian actually looks like on a regular basis? Because it's more than just going to church, occasionally serving, and occasionally being nice on Sundays and Wednesdays. It's so much more than that. It's the entirety of your being each and every day. He says this in verse 19. Uh, Nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands, having this seal. The Lord knows whose are his. Let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. That's one of the first things he mentions. If you are a Christian, you are not to be caught up in iniquity, which simply means sinfulness. You can look through all the lists in the, the Bible and we can know what sin is because God defines it. Whether it's Romans chapter 1, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, Galatians chapter 5, Colossians chapter 3, Revelation chapter 21, we have a series of lists where we can know exactly what sin is. And if you are a Christian, you separate yourself from that. That may take a little bit of time. That may take some struggles. But you separate yourself from it. Got it. He then goes on, let's skip down to verse 22, and he hits some specific things. He says, flee youthful lusts. Pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Avoid foolish and ignorant disputes, knowing that they generate strife. And a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient, and humility, correcting those who um, are in opposition, if God perhaps will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth. And then they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. These are things that are found in a Christian. If you are a Christian, these are things you must focus on. And they're tough sometimes, aren't they? They can be tough because they conflict with what we see so much in the world. But you are not of the world. You are of God. In our world, it's very common to quarrel over so little. You throw an opinion up online. You just wait for it. There will be people who will come after that opinion with full force. And in there you have a temptation. Do I fight back? Do I push back at them? Or do I become a person of peace? I'm about God's word. I can't get caught up in the foolish tales and the old wise fables or the rumors or the the gossip or the nonsense that exists in the world. My ambition is to spread the gospel. My ambition is truth. So let me be about peace. Let me be about repentance. Let me be about the things of God. That's not the way of the world. So there has to be a shift in our mindset that defines us as Christians separate than the mindset of the world. These are examples of how that unfolds. And man, it can be so hard because you have a lot beating down on your head of who you should be, but you are of God. And you must display the fact that you are of God to the people that you're teaching to be a disciple. It's critical that we understand from the Bible what it means to be a Christian. I love also in 1 Peter chapter 3, we'll look at it this one real quick before we move on. He says, finally, all of you be of one mind. Be of one mind. If you are a Christian, you are going to be a pursuer of unity with the brethren. Not compromising, of course, uh, the truth, but you're going to be of one mind because we're all pursuing it. You're having compassion for one another. You love as brothers. You're tender-hearted. You're courteous. Not returning evil for evil, nor reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing. Knowing that you were called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. For he who would love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, but his ears are open, and his ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. We're starting to see some things that denote Christians, especially so. And those are the things that we must pursue and put into our lives. And if it's something contrary to that, set them aside. You have no time for them, Christians. They will be a distraction to you, and they will corrupt your ministry, your effectiveness in discipling others. Paul's given him this as a model, so we know exactly what a Christian looks like. You can read the rest in Romans chapter 12. It's fantastic. I would encourage you to read that as well. And these are things you reflect on, but also things that you teach. Show a person what it means to be a Christian by a biblical definition. That's where they will transform inwardly, and that will affect how they move outwardly in this world. We're understanding it from God's will. 
his perspective, and also having confidence in God's help. Number two, we need biblical examples. These things are fine, but we need to understand what they actually look like. And that's how I learn best. You can tell me to be kind to someone, I'll be like, okay. But what does that actually mean? What does that actually look like? What are the parameters? Those are things that I need, and maybe you do too. Some of you are going to be so gifted in kindness, you're like, what are you talking about? It's so easy. And you just skip down the streets and in the grocery stores and up schnooks, and you're very kind. I, I need more definition than that. That's why I'm grateful for the biblical narratives. The Bible's so unusual, and because it is a book of law for sure, and we do have the law of Christ, but it's got story after story after story. And those aren't accidents. Those are ways that help us to understand how, how to be faithful to God and how not to be faithful to God in some, some cases. But I need those narratives that show Christianity being modeled. There's two real quick I want us to look at. Luke chapter 21 is a fantastic one because this is Jesus teaching his disciples what giving needs to look like, what generosity needs to look like. In Luke chapter 21, we have an account of uh, the widow and her two mites. You might be very familiar with this one, but think of the impact this must have on his disciples and the fact that Jesus is modeling behaviors and what Christianity needs to look like by using this positive example of this lady. He says he looked up and saw the rich putting their gifts into the treasury, and he saw also a poor, certain poor widow putting in two mites. So he said, truly I say to you that this poor widow was put in more than all. For all of these out of their abundance have put in offerings for God. But she, out of her poverty, put in all the livelihood that she had. What an incredible lesson. She might have been a woman that people only noticed because, you know, she's incredibly poor. That might look out of place in comparison to the incredibly wealthy, what is she doing here? It might be someone that they would dismiss. But Jesus is using this moment to show what matters most. And it begins in her heart, her devotion, her love for God. And this is a biblical narrative where Jesus himself is pointing this out as a moment of excellence, incredible excellence. You may be focused on all the, the money, the big bags of money that might be dropped in and hear them plink, plink, plinking into whatever the collection is. But you should be paying attention to this woman because she gave everything. And that's the heart that God desires. That is an example of what following God must look like. We know this because Jesus himself demonstrated that when he went to the cross to an incredible degree. As Rodney said, he let himself be called a rebel and be with the re rebellious people, but he was guilty of no sin. There was an injustice done to him in his death. And yet he did it willingly out of love and gave everything he possibly could because we needed him. He was a servant through and through. Even as he hung on the cross, his willingness to forgive was amazing. As he looked down on the traitorous people and those that would speak lies about him, and he says, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. What an incredible level of kindness and goodness and generosity and on and on and on. And that Jesus is using this woman as an example of how we need to be internally and how that would manifest externally. Give abundantly of yourself completely and wholly to God. How amazing. I think we need to share these narratives. That was pretty common. But we can't also forget the ones that are less common. The Holy Spirit chose what goes into the Bible. It's His will that that unfolded. And He inspired the men to record the Bible. So it's not an accident that they're in there. I love the stories in the Old Testament. The kings we don't often talk about. In 2 Chronicles chapter 20, we have this incredible example of vulnerability and faith. We have a man, King Jehoshaphat, who had his moments that were tremendous. He tore down idols and such and cleared those out of the land. But he also was made some poor choices in that he aligned himself with King Ahab. What a terrible choice. And he got in a bit of trouble at Ramoth Gilead in that association. But there came a point in which his kingdom was about to be besieged by three mighty armies and they recognized that they did not have the power to stop them. They were going to be devastated. But in vulnerability and in humility, they turned to God. I love his prayer. 
I absolutely adore his prayer. It's so important that we understand examples of good prayer and examples of great vulnerability and humility when you are facing life, but to know that you have confidence in God is so important. It's a way that we can teach and demonstrate a biblical example of what a faithful person looks like. In that prayer, he says this, and if you turn over to 2 Chronicles chapter 20, you could read along. Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court, and he said, O Lord God of our fathers, are you not God in heaven? Do you not rule over all the kingdoms of the nations, and in your hand is there not power and might? So that no one is able to withstand you. He's praising God in his prayer. Are you not our God who drove out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel? And you gave it to the descendants of Abraham, your friend forever. And they dwell in it and have built you a sanctuary in it for your name, saying, if disaster comes upon us, sword, judgment, pestilence, or famine, we will stand before this temple and in your presence, for your name is in this temple, and cry out to you in our affliction. And you will hear and you will save. Do you hear him recalling the relationship they have with God and praising him for his good works? Do you read in this that he's calling to God in a moment of vulnerability, but it's wrapped up in faith and utter confidence that God will be there to help? And now here are the people of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, whom you would not let Israel invade when they came out of the land of Egypt. But they turned from them and did not destroy them. And here they are, rewarding us by coming to throw us out of your possession, which you have given us to inherit. Oh, our God... Will you not judge them? For we have no power against this great multitude that is coming against us, nor do we know what to do. But our eyes are upon you. I mean, you kind of get chills. It looks hopeless. It looks like we have nothing that we can possibly do. They knew the Bible examples. Of course they did, right? The story that Randy King taught so well uh, Wednesday night with David and Goliath. David went in with utter confidence that Goliath must fall because of his faith in God. He had five stones, a sling, and of course he would take that giant sword and cleave his head clean off in victory. God gave him the battle. They have nothing with which they can stand against these mighty armies. They are powerless, except they have God, the Almighty, and their eyes are upon Him. What an incredible story. What a reminder, not just a story, but a historical account of real people being real biblical examples of what it means to be devoted to God. These are things that we must teach and understand and appreciate and model our lives after. It's learning to be an excellent disciple. We need examples of excellence. It's so important. That's why we teach Noah. That's why we teach David. That's why we teach so many Esther and so many of these other stories that sometimes we're like, well, we're just learning Bible stories. No, 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 no. You're learning how faithful people are pleasing God. You're learning a pathway, a trajectory that they took that you might imitate as they imitate God and the faithful themselves. You're participating in what it means to be a disciple. It's so, so valuable. Commit these to your heart and to your head and then live them faithfully. Third thing we want to model as we close out here, modern Christians. Now this really puts it on our shoulders, doesn't it? You are a modern Christian. Someone is going to need you to teach them what it means to be a disciple. You need to model that to the utmost of your ability. Well, Paul did that. I bring him up as an example because sometimes we don't think of it this way. But he was a very present example with Timothy. He was a contemporary of Timothy's, which means Timothy had him to look, look at and to follow after and to learn from every single day. From that Acts 16 moment to going to the synagogues and teaching in Acts 17 in Thessalonica and seeing just how vile people could be at others coming to know Christ. To seeing Paul go through so much suffering that he listed down in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. But even in those very, very small moments, personal moments, when being a Christian means just serving one another and loving one another. I love 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 13. It's like one of those verses you don't really pay attention to because all it is is Paul telling Timothy, bring me a cloak, bring me the books, especially the parchment. That's personal. 
He names this specific cloak, and Timothy, he knows, is going to take care of it. But he's also modeling behavior for Timothy by saying, bring me the books. He's asked Timothy time and time again to study and on the word, meditate on the word, communicate with the people. But he's including Timothy in that process to a very grand level and also at a very small level. He's covering all the details. In fact, we, like Paul, must cover the full measure of being a Christian. And that's not just on Sundays and occasional Wednesdays. It's every single day. The full capacity of kindness and love for the brethren. The full capacity of going out into the community and sharing the gospel. The full capacity of demonstrating to the world that they can look at you and they can see the biblical examples. And more importantly, when they look at you and your life and how you are living Christianity, they see Jesus and he shines so bright in your life. Maybe it's to the point where they notice there's a distinct difference between how you think and the world thinks and they say, what is going on with you? They may reject it. They may think it's foolishness. They're allowed that choice. But it's not going to be because we demonstrate it poorly. We've got to think big and be very generous in this regard. I'm going to leave you with some examples of some people that I know personally. I'll name some, not all of them, because they wouldn't want it. And unless they've cleared it, I'm not going to say their names. But there are examples of people that I know that are doing exceptional and amazing things for Christianity. I like the high bar. I love those stories. Not because they're unobtainable, but because someone we know has done that. Which means, I can do it too. You can do it too. And we can raise the bar even higher next time. I know a guy who has a second job. He doesn't need a second job. He's fine. He's okay. But he takes a second job strictly so he can use that money to fund efforts at his congregation. If there are people that go without, he's going to provide for them from a second job that he doesn't need. If there are things that are happening in the mission field that need effort, he's going to provide for it from the second job which he doesn't need. It's because he loves the church and he knows people have need and he's able to provide. So he takes on a second job. That's incredible to me. That's love and devotion that I, I love it. And I, and I love to see it emulated because it's based in biblical example. And it's based on exactly what a Christian would do, wouldn't they? If you care that much for the church, what wouldn't you put in for it? What wouldn't you give? Would you give all like the widow in her mind? I know a lady, she lives in a different state, and you aren't going to know her, but I love what she does. She goes to a rather large church, and they have multiple services. She attends the earliest one she possibly can on purpose. It's very deliberate. She does this so that when the extra services go on, she goes off into a room with some other people, and they pray for the success of the other services. They pray for the ministers. They pray for the elders. They pray for the deacons. They pray for all the worship leaders and the people that are involved in service. They pray for the visitors and they pray for the members that people can give their hearts fully to the Lord. They love the church so much that they spend their Sunday in prayer for the sake of the Lord's church. That's amazing. That's phenomenal. I love those examples so, so much. I shared with you sometime before about a guy I know he's trying to teach his granddaughter how to be a servant and how to love people. And like the Good Samaritan, they get out and they put uh, various... um, gas and food and water and such in their trunk and they would drive around their community looking for people that they could help people that they could serve they went looking for it that's deliberate and it's beautiful because he's teaching his granddaughter and instilling that in her that this is valuable and he was giving her that time it's amazing but that's a real person doing that today Jerome said I could mention his name because, frankly, I think this is amazing. Someone who wants the gospel out so much that you're willing to start your own radio program, the Word 120, and you're committed to every morning getting up and writing scripts and going down and recording it so people can know the gospel message. You're so committed that you'll put up billboards to make sure they can know how to connect to that. It's phenomenal. What, what an encouraging thing to see in another Christian that lives today. It's a high, high bar. I appreciate those so much because it pushes me. I hope it pushes you to say, you know what? If that's what's taking place in the lives of real Christians today, how do I get on board? How can I be motivated to raise the bar even higher? What I would love is if those kind of things, which seem so exceptional, and they are, what if they became so common, so normal, that they're the 
lowest expectation. Can you imagine what that would look like? What if it was totally normal to go out every day looking for people to serve? And what if it was totally normal to create, just to sit down and create a radio program or an internet program and to reach out to people? And what if it was normal to pray every single worship service for the benefit? And what if it was normal for Christians to take on second jobs and do things to give completely? If that was normal, can you imagine what the exceptional would be? Can you imagine what the exceptional would be? And can you imagine how the world would look at that and go, these Christians, this Jesus, it's amazing. And they keep raising the bar and they keep demonstrating exactly what's in this book. And they keep pulling people closer and closer to God and they are building one another up. They model it. That would be phenomenal, wouldn't it? It's a funny thing to talk about, but it's a great thing to do. I can share those stories with you and we can let them go in our ears and just simply be stories. Man, I'm glad those people are doing something. Let's not make that mistake. Let's listen to these stories. Let's listen to these Bible narratives. Let's look at the Bible definition of Christianity and say, that's for me. That's for me to do. I encourage you to take ownership of whatever talents and abilities and resources and opportunities God has given you. Utilize that. Utilize that and teach that to the people around you. There is someone that needs to be sharing you, not for your pride, but for God's glory, the amazing things that you are doing in Christianity. Teach them how to be excellent Christians. That's the charge I'll leave you with today. Take ownership, be exceptionally generous, stick with the Bible and its definitions. Today, there may be some way that we can help you in that. Today, you may be far from Jesus and you're like, I'm tired of that. I see the truth in the scriptures and I see what it means to be a Christian and I need to be that. We want to be here for you. There's multiple Bible studies that are taking place in our congregations and I pray for them and I hope you do as well. But there are some people we don't know that they have that struggle in their heart and I pray for you as well. If today is the day that you know I need to answer that gospel call, don't hesitate. Don't second guess yourself. If there's something that you know, we, you know in your heart that you need to obey faithfully, the repentance and the confession and the baptism and the, the, the committed life to Jesus, Don't hold back on it. We're here for you. God's here for you. We'll help you in whatever way we can. If there's something we can do for you, come forward as we stand and as we sing.